So I spent a little bit of time this week, truthfully yesterday morning, um, thinking through what would be a great opening illustration to talk about fear and anxiety. And then I realized I don't need an opening illustration. We simply live in a world and a society and a culture that is very good at creating worry and fear and anxiety. And we like to talk about how this is, you know, the no one's ever experienced as much worry and fear as we are experiencing in this day and age. And I always think, I'm not so sure about that. But there's so much talk about fear and anxiety and worry. And when we think about, as I think about this concept of worry and what we're going to be talking about this morning as Jesus addresses the issues of worry and anxiety, I think they're, they come at us in two different levels. There are those kind of macro worries that we have. Uh, we consider, as Pastor Scott alluded to in his prayer, of, of what we see happening in the Middle East and Israel and Palestine and, and Gaza and, and trying to sort through the, the, the violence that has been experienced and is continuing uh, to, the people are continuing to experience. Uh, we think about climate change. This is great. Scott's prayer just went right into the beginning of my sermon so well today. Um, the devastation of, 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 Acapulco, right? All of a sudden I was like Cancun, Acapulco. Um, but it's, it's one of many of just this world that seems to be in a dark place. The violence in Maine of yet another shooter taking innocent lives, mowing down people. And that can't help but create some worry and anxiety in our own lives. So we have that sort of macro perspective, but then there's also the micro perspective of making our way in our own lives here in San Diego, California, or wherever you're watching this from, of trying to navigate seasons of grief and loss and lives taken too early, the ravages of cancer, and mental illness, and it is anxiety producing. Like I told you, I don't need a sermon illustration, right, to bring this up, to make it, we all know it, we're all in it. And so Jesus comes along in the Sermon on the Mount, which we've been working our way through, and he says, don't worry. And he's going to say it a number of times in the text that we're going to look at this morning. And I want to say back to Jesus, but I'm so good at it. Like, this is the one thing I kind of excel at. Maybe some of you in this room are really good at that as well. I know not everyone is a chronic warrior. I, I, I just blame my grandma for that because she, like, worried for our family. And then when she died, like, 15 years ago, you know, I, I think all of that just fell to me. I don't know. But maybe that's not true. But I'm not quite sure how that happened. But, but it's like, but Jesus comes along and says, no, that's not your path. That's not the direction I want you to go. And so in our text this morning, it's going to start with the word therefore. And whenever you see a therefore, you, as I've talked about before, you need to pay attention to kind of what's come before that. And we're not going to look at all the three things that have come before that, but it's basically uh, the passage that Jared Noel preached on last week of prayer. So Jesus says, you need to have your prayer life right. And then he talks about fasting in Matthew 6. And I would say that that's our personal spiritual disciplines. And then he talks about what do we do with our treasure and that we ought to have treasure in heaven. So he's building this case for saying, this is why you don't have to worry. Because he's saying that when your prayer life is right, and when you are practicing the disciplines of the faith, and when you are making sure that your treasure is in heaven and not here on earth, you have the ability to not worry. So that's what we're going to be about this morning. It's not so much talking about the reality of worry and the reality of anxiety, but thinking through how then do we deal with it? What are some practical steps that we can take in order that anxiety and worry does not overwhelm us? And I do want to add one more note to this. I recognize that there are some who have such debilitating um, illness and such debilitating ideas around worry and anxiety that Jesus and something else might be required. 
that there, and luckily or fortunately, we live in a culture where there is medical help. But for most of us and many of us in this room, it is an issue that is, that is a reality in our lives. And so I want to talk about basically what does the Bible have to say to us? What does Jesus have to say to us around the topic of worry? So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, and I would invite you to pray with me. O oh Lord, we gather around your word. Your word, which is living and active, your word, which does not return to you empty, but as the prophet Isaiah reminds us, it accomplishes the purpose for which you intended it. So may these words of Jesus about anxiety and worry and fear be words that can speak hope into our lives. Because, Lord, we are a weary nation. We are a worried nation. We are a worried people, and we need your help. So guide us, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So as I said, we start with the therefore. It's right there, the very first word. So Christ has built this on saying, hey, when your prayer life is right and your spiritual disciplines are right, and when you're putting your treasure in the right place and focusing on me, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? We're going to come back to that. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Amen, and I'm walking off the stage. Each day has enough trouble or worry of its own. Jesus actually addresses the topic of worry and anxiety quite often in his preaching and in his teaching. In Matthew 13, he tells a story, he tells a parable about the sower and the seed. And you may recall this story that Jesus tells. And uh, the, the sower sowed, sowed seed with this sort of reckless abandon. And, and for me, that is such a helpful image when we think about what is the kingdom of God like and what is the message of Jesus all about, that it, it, it's sown kind of recklessly. Like he, the, the, the sower throws the seed everywhere. Remember, it, it, some of it goes on the path. Birds come and take it away. Some of it is um, grows, throws, is thrown amongst the rocks and it pops up and then it kind of the sun hits it and it dies. Some of it's thrown amongst the thorns. The thorns come around and choke out the word of God. And then some of it's thrown in the good soil. But I love the image of the God who says, I am going to cast my word and my message of grace as wide as possible to any who will hear it. But in Matthew chapter six, or Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, Jesus talks about the seed that falls amongst the thorns, saying this. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the what? Worries. I didn't hear that very loudly. The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. The worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth, choke out the word, choke out that message of grace. And so Jesus teaches and preaches and speaks about this issue of worry. There is the very well-known story in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 of Martha and Mary. 
We read this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. My sermon this morning is not on this part of the text, although it actually is kind of on this part of the text. But I, I, I want you to notice where Mary is positioned. She's sitting at the feet of the rabbi. This is the position of a student. This is the position of one who would learn from the rabbi and then would go and teach others. We should not miss this of the important role that women played in the ministry of Jesus. Because by Matthew, or by, by Luke telling us this story, he is saying, understand how Jesus saw Mary. He saw her as a student, one who would then take his teachings and live them out in the world. Okay. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I love that. Jesus, tell her to get up from your feet and tell her to come help me and do whatever it is that I am doing. And then this line, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried. That word for worry there is the same one that Jesus uses a little, uses in the Sermon on the Mount. It has to do with being distracted and being divided. Her mind is divided by many things. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. Martha's mind is divided. She's not thinking of just the one thing which is sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening. But instead, she is distracted by many things that are going on in her world. And this is always the issue in front of us because our world and our society and our culture and our work life and our however else you want to describe this, it has a great way of distracting us and pulling us away from the thing that really matters. So you all know I'm a finance major, background in finance. And I tend, like the, the Prince of Darkness Grimm that we just sang about, right? And that, and that, that when Blue Lowe did the, you know, that the whole... He would not like, by the way, I just described that, by the way. But the Prince of Darkness, Grim, we tremble not for him, right? That, that, but So this is the way, but, but the Prince of Darkness, Grim, is a reality. Like when Martin Luther is writing this hymn, he's like, the devil is real. Like we are fools if we start to think that there is not some supernatural expression of evil that is out there that, 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 I mean, for century after century after century, people have believed that. The Prince of Darkness, Grim, we tremble not for him. But the problem is I start to tremble, because here's what the Prince of Darkness Graham does in my financial brain. And you're going, to be, you're going to be sitting here when I'm done with this going like, I didn't know today was a stewardship sermon. But here's the way it works. Our elders approve a new budget in June, which calls for a 9% increase of income, not because we're giving fabulous raises, not because we're going out and doing brand new extravagant sorts of things, but in case you have not noticed, the cost of living and the cost of maintaining a facility like this does nothing but increase and increase and increase and increase. So I'm like, we're approving a budget of 9% more income. Okay, God is faithful. We go through the month of July and it is all great. And we come to the month of August and we have the worst month of August in financial income since I have been at this church. Seriously. And the Prince of Darkness Grimm just keeps working his magic in my head of like, you're not going to make budget. It's not going to happen. The people's generosity of the church is going to decrease. Now we've had a decent July and we had a decent September. So I'm like, oh, it's okay. And then it just keeps going on. So I read in the news, did you happen to see this? The most expensive city to live in, in the whole United States, San Diego, in case you missed it which is great if you own property here, but if you're trying to get people to move to San Diego to work for a church, guess what? Not many people want to do that. And my anxiety and worry goes up. And we're getting ready to move into stewardship season. 
And we need to make sure we have a big November and December. And guess what happens? Fear, anxiety, worry. I'm making sure I didn't put, miss anything else in here that I had written down. Yeah, I think I got most of them there. That's how bad it is. I wrote them down, right? Like, I'm afraid I'm going to forget. Like, I'm going to get up here. But I share that with you because for me, that, that's the way the devil in the world works on me. And I worry, like, are we going to have a compelling enough story to tell in order that people will be generous with the church? And I can go on and on and on. And Jesus is like, shh. Sit down at my feet. You're worried and anxious about things that you cannot control. And I'm like, oh, I can control them, Lord. Trust me, I have a pulpit. Like, I get to stand here. I can control that. And God's like, no, 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 no. Just sit at my feet. I've guided this church. This is God speaking to me. I've guided this church since 1905. Why would I walk away from it now? Paul, you're anxious and worried about many things. And it's distracting you. And it's distracting your ministry. And it's distracting your proclamation of the gospel. Paul, come and sit at my feet. Have the posture of faith. That's where it has to begin. You see, I think Jesus' images that he gives us in this uh, teaching, in the Sermon on the Mount, he does not assume that life is going to be easy. He says the grass grows and the lilies grow amongst it, but what happens to that grass eventually? Did y'all catch that? It's cut down and burned. The birds of the air at times fall out of the sky. But what I think Jesus is saying is that you must recognize that God knows all of these things. And that God sees you in the midst of whatever it is that you are walking through. And so you don't need to worry. We're not freed from responsibility but we are freed from anxiety and worry. The birds of the air still have to fend for themselves. We as well have work to do, but God says, or Jesus says, you don't have to be filled with anxiety. First Peter verse five, or chapter five, verse seven, makes a very simple statement. This is it. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. Please notice that that word says cast what? That second word there, all. Cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. That word for cast right there or casting, it is a one and done. It is you back up the dump truck of your life with all your worries and all your anxieties and you just download it on God, right? That's Paul Cunningham's modern day version of what I think Peter is trying to say there, right? Because I got a lot in my dump truck. Like, I don't know I don't know about you all, but maybe you all are all perfect and don't have any of these worries and anxieties or any of these other sorts of things that are kind of going on in, in my head and my heart and everything. But I'm like, Lord, I got some stuff. And I think Peter was saying to that church, which that church had a lot to worry about because the Roman Empire was going nuts and was getting ready to start destroying Christians. And, and as Peter writes to those, to those congregations, they're dealing with stress and they're dealing with anxiety. And he says, take all, cast all, bring it all together and give it to God. Why? Because God cares for you. If he cares about the flowers of the field and the birds of the air, Jesus says, do you know how much more he cares about you? Take that stuff which burdens you and holds you down and brings you worry and anxiety and give it back to God and trust that God will take it. So 
I find it really, this text, like when I was reading through the, the, the Sermon on the Mount and deciding which, which verses we were going to use and I was going to teach through and, and preach through, it's, it's, there's this very subtle line that shows up right as Jesus is getting done with the Sermon on the Mount. I, I brought it up to you because I wanted you to make sure that you heard it. And, 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 and he's saying, you know, he, he's talking about if this is how God closed the grass, this is verse 30, the grass of the field, here today, gone tomorrow, thrown in the fire, will not much more clothe you. And then this line, you of little faith. And I'm not sure I've ever really caught that in the midst of this whole Sermon on the Mount, and particularly in this touching when he's teaching about worry. He says, and, and just for all of you, you of little faith. Now, I've got to say, a little faith is better than no faith, Right? But he is recognizing the difficulty and the struggle that the disciples will have and that you and I are going to have of sitting at the feet of Jesus like Mary was doing. Because our faith oftentimes doesn't feel strong enough, doesn't feel aligned enough, however it is that you might want to describe that. And Jesus says, you of little faith, now, that phrase is used several times in Scripture. Jesus actually uses it, very interestingly, just two chapters later in the Gospel of Matthew. Story that we know fairly well, Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. Then Jesus got into a boat because he had been teaching and preaching, and he got into a boat, and his disciples followed him. Now notice something, because you probably know what's happening in the very next sentence. And if not, it's probably up on the screen, right? So you, you, you're, you're, you're tracking with that. There are times in our lives, and I hate to break this to you, that Jesus is going to lead you into a storm. Because notice what happens in this text. Jesus knows, Jesus is God, right? Let's remember this. He knows full well it's going to happen on the Sea of Galilee. He says to his disciples, hey, let's go. They climb into the boat. Verse 24, suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. I just love this. There's a storm all around and the savior of the world's like just taking a nap. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus gets on a boat. A storm comes up and he is able to rest, to sleep in the midst of the storm because he is one with the Father. Because he knows that God has a good and perfect plan. And my question or my point in the, there, there's actually two points in this story that I want to bring out. The first one is this, is if Jesus can rest in a storm, can we not do the same thing? That when the storms of our lives, that when worry and anxiety and fear cause us to be restless. Can we not rest just like Jesus? And how can we rest just like Jesus? How can we be certain that we can do that? Because Jesus doesn't simply rest, but when he is awakened, what does he do? Oh, he stands up and he rebukes the winds and the waves and the storm. And he stands with the disciples. 
And what I want to suggest to us is we need to remember that it is possible to rest in Jesus when the storms are brewing around us. Because not only does Jesus rest, but he also stands. And he speaks. And he says, be calm. And those disciples are baffled once again. Who is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him because no one had that kind of power. And so when Jesus says, I want you to come sit at my feet and I want you to rest at my feet and I want to speak grace and truth into your life and I want you to not be distracted by the things of this world, recognize the power of that Lord who calls you to that place of rest, to cast your anxieties and your fears upon him. Because you see what worry does, it steals. It steals your peace and it steals your joy. What Paul says, uh, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I think is that, y'all, anybody, is that somewhere in the New Testament Paul writes that, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you're right. That, that, That sounds right. You know, what does the thief do? He comes to kill and steal and destroy. And Jesus is saying here, when you worry and when you have anxiety, you lose your peace. You lose your joy. Because what happens is this, like I can, I I can, I can burn so much energy worrying about something, right? Or having anxiety about something and not just for today, but something that's way into the future, right? And so I spend all day today worrying, anxiety, fear, all this sort of stuff. And tomorrow comes and guess what? The thing that I worried about and anxiety about and I had fear about doesn't happen. And so what have I done? I've wasted today because I've been so worried about something that might not even happen. And it's probably something I couldn't have controlled anyway. That's what worry does. It steals your peace. It steals your joy. (sighs) One more thing. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. There's one more how I want to suggest of how we work on living a worry-free life, at least as much as that's possible. The Apostle Paul, near the end of this letter to the church at Philippi, says this. uh, Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. So these words are very important here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, and notice this, the the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, and now Paul tells us what to think about. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. My friends, this passage If you want to know the worry-busting passage or anxiety-busting passage in Scripture, this is it. I mean, Jesus says, don't worry. Like, that's great that Jesus says, don't worry. The Apostle Paul is helpful because he comes along and says, let me unpack that a little bit for you, how that actually works itself out, right? Sorry, I stopped right in the middle of that sentence, but I just, I had to say that. Um, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And and now notice this, the God of peace, because remember earlier it was the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind. And now Paul comes along and he says, and now the God of peace will be with you. Once again, do not be anxious about anything. But in prayer and petition with thanksgiving to God, present your requests to God. What is that saying? Paul's saying, you know, you start with gratitude. If you want to defeat the enemy of anxiety and worry and fear, you start with gratitude. 
You present your requests to God, your petitions and your prayers, but you do it from a place of gratitude, a place of thankfulness, a place of saying, God, I know you got a plan. I don't understand your plan, but I know you're a good God. And I'm going to trust that to you. I'm going to trust the fear and the anxiety that I'm carrying right now. And I am going to give that to you with gratitude. Because we can be grateful because what has God done for us? Well, he saved us to everlasting life, not just abundant life here and now, but also everlasting life. Paul says, present your prayers and petitions to God with thankfulness. Don't be anxious. And then he says, think about the right things. You know, we got the whole psychological movement now. We talk a lot about mindfulness, right? Like you hear everywhere you go, there's mindfulness and you gotta get your mind. Guess who came up with that first? I mean, the apostle Paul's saying it. Think about these things. He like, sometimes I feel people, you know, when you're a preacher or a teacher, people are like, just show me how. Right? You know, it's like, well, you get up there and you have all these stories and you tell the stuff and you talk about Jesus and da da da. But show me how. Paul does it right here. He says, here's what you need to do when you sit at the feet of Jesus. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Because we get into a rut of doom and gloom and despair, and we forget, we forget about the things that were just there. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. By the way, can we give Jennifer a big hand? Because she keeps up with me every Sunday. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. But I love this because he's like, this is what you think about. Good, noble, right. I mean, all these other, these lovely words, whatever is lovely, admirable. You think about the fact that your Savior gave his life for you so that you might have life and have it abundant. Think about such things. See, when Jesus ends his story of the Sermon on the Mount, or his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount on worry, he says two things. Seek first my kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. And my righteousness. Put everything that you've got towards seeking God's kingdom thinking about what the kingdom of God is all about. And then Paul says, and work for God's righteousness in the world. And in doing that, we'll have our focus on the right place. We'll be looking to Jesus rather than allowing fear and anxiety to not only run our lives, but to ruin our lives. Pray with me, please. Lord, um, we live in a troublesome world. Many of us in this room have worries and burdens and anxieties that are holding us back. And Lord, I confess it is hard to simply sit at your feet sometimes and to trust in your good and perfect plan. It is so easy to be distracted by other things. And yet your call on our lives is to walk by faith, even if it's a little faith, to walk by faith, to be in your presence. And so, Lord, allow us to cast our anxieties onto you. Allow us in all things, with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, to present our requests to you, Lord, because in doing that, you help to take our anxiety away. Let us always look to you, O oh God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.